So we're delighted today to be joined at this same Scotland event by the diversity researchers who will introduce their plans to investigate knowledge gaps in woodland diversification for long term resilience in the UK. So diversity is a collaborative project between the James Hutton Institute, the Woodland Trust, Bangor University, Birmingham University, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh and the RSPB. And the overall goal is to provide woodland man managers with the knowledge and the tools required to make our woods and forests more resilient. So we've got four speakers with us today from the project. We have Ruth Mitch Mitchell, who's the project leader for Diversity, and she's based at the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen. We have Seamus Bates, a so social scientist from Bangor University, uh, Mojan Rabi, a microbiologist from Birmingham University and Chris Nichols, who's the conservation and evidence manager at the Woodland Trust. So welcome to you all today. So we are going to start today's event with a couple of polls. Um, so I'm just going to launch question one. Can you let me know that you can see that all OK? Yes, we can see that. OK. Thank you, Ruth. So maybe I should just read the question out. So we're asking whether we, you think our native woodlands are sufficiently diverse in their tree species composition to enable them to withstand future threats. And you can say yes, no, or don't know. And then submit your vote. And I think we should then see some polls coming up. Okay, so I'll end the poll there. I think nearly everyone has voted. So can you see the results? Yep, so I think there's a typo in that, but I assume that it's no is the, the dominant answer. We've got a yes, no, don't know. Uh, yes, so 66% yes, have said no. No. Yep. And then we've got a very similar question for our next poll, which is but, but around coniferous woodlands, so commercial plantation woodlands, whether we think they're diverse or not. So I think that's the majority of voted now, Ruth. So I'll end okay, the poll. Okay, yep, thank you. Okay, yep. And again, um, even more people there saying that they don't think our coniferous woodlands are diverse enough. So but for both of those two um, polls, the majority of you are indicating that perhaps you don't think our woodlands are very diverse and that might impact how resilient um, those woodlands are. And that's really setting the background for the project that we'd like to talk to you about today. So I will, there we go. Yeah, move on to our first slide. As Annie kindly said, um, this is a seminar about a project called Diversity Tree. Um, and thank you very much for inviting us um, along to speak to you today. So this project only started in August. It's part of what the, um, UK research councils called their Treescapes funding and this project is part of their second round of funding um, that started in August so we're very much telling you the what we hope to achieve in this two-year project. Uh, it's put I'm leading the project from the James Hutton Institute but we've got a range of collaborators that you can see there and then also project partners of Forest Research and Nature Scott. So it's very much a collaborative project across all these organisations. And Diversity has the overall aim of wanting to increase the resilience of our woodlands, both the current woodlands that we've got and our future woodlands, by diversifying the tree species composition of those woodlands. Now we're well aware that um, genetic diversity is also important in um, resilience of woodlands and diversi diversity. But we're not focusing on genetic diversity because there are other um, projects within the Treescapes portfolio of projects 
that are looking at genetic diversity. You'll see there that we said we want to work across a range of scales, and we said from microbes to mines, and we've got the mines in there to really highlight the fact that we're not just looking across a range of biological scales, but we're also including the human aspects of diversifying our woodlands. And we very much want to try and understand the methods too, and the impacts of diversifying tree species composition. So this slide here outlines pictorially why diversifying our woodlands might be important and what the challenges are that we're addressing in this project. So currently, a lot of our semi-natural woodlands and our commercial woodlands are often dominated by just one or two um, tree species. We know we're facing a range of pests and pathogens and climate change. And if those pests or pathogens particularly impact one tree species, then, and that tree species is a dominant um, tree species in your woodland, then that can have a big impact on the whole woodland. Alternatively, if you've got a more diverse woodland, you can have the same range of pests and pathogens, but if they just impact one or two tree species, you've still got a whole range of other tree species in your woodland that will carry on the functioning of that woodland. So the diversity project is really looking at how you might move from a more single species dominated woodland to a more diverse woodland. And there are many ecological reasons why a more diverse woodland might be more resilient. And we're focusing in on a couple of them. So firstly, a more diverse woodland might be able to deliver a greater range of functions. So we know this in crop systems, if you have a greater diversity of crops, you have a greater diversity of predators and you've got greater biological control. But we don't know if the same can happen in our woodland systems. In addition, if you've got a more diverse woodland, tree species might be able to substitute for one another. This is what we call functional redundancy. So if one species is lost due to a disease or to climate change, other tree species might be able to fill that niche and provide similar functioning. But obviously, if we're going to change the diversity of our woodlands, we need to involve the stakeholders that use the woodlands that manage and manage the woodlands. And those woodland managers need to have the knowledge to enable them to make those management choices. So diversity is addressing four challenges. And I'll just briefly go through what those four challenges are. So firstly, we need to understand how woodland managers and other stakeholders understand the diversity of woodlands and at what different scales. And what are their ambitions in terms of a future woodland? How do they see diversity helping um, woodlands more resilient? Secondly, we want to see whether diversity will increase ecosystem functionality. And by that, particularly whether it changes the microbial diversity. So we're specifically looking at the leaf microbiome, so the microbes on the leaf, and whether a greater diversity of trees will help increase the diversity of the microbes and hence increase resistance to pathogens. Thirdly, we're wanting to look at whether a more diverse woodland can increase what we're calling this functional redundancy, so how tree species can substitute for one another and continue to support the lack biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. And then finally, we want to know how we can actually implement this. So what management strategies can we use to increase woodland resilience? And we're specifically going to focus on four, which we'll go into in a bit more detail, but they're continuous forestry cover, natural regeneration, um, planting of novel um, planting species or species that are perhaps non-native or not native to that region. And then finally, microbial diversification. And we're wanting to see how we can communicate management strategies to increase woodland resilience. So these four challenges are addressed in four words. Um, and we're going to go into each of these four challenges in a little bit more detail um, as we go through this, this seminar. But I really just wanted to highlight the brown boxes here. So just to make you aware that we've got a project advisory board. 
and that's composed of people um, providing a sort of high level overview of the whole project and links to other research and work that's going on. So it includes people from the Woodland Trust, from um, the Forestry Commission, from DEFRA and from the RSPB, for example. And we've also got a practitioners panel. And these are very much people on the ground that are making sure that the work we're doing is um, relevant and how helping us think through how we can translate the results of our research into practical um, management on the ground. So in our project, we're specifically going to focus on conifers. That's because most of the tree planting that's going on in the UK is conifers. And we're focusing specifically on Scots pine, which is, you know, is our native conifer, very important in the Scottish um, Caledonian pine forests, but can also be planted for a variety of conservation reasons and also commercial value. And then we're contrasting that with Sitka spruce, which as I'm sure you're aware, it's not native, but it's planted very widely in commercial timber plantations. We've had to focus on a couple of woodland types just because of the short time span of this project, it's only two years, but we will be assessing the transferability of the, our results to other woodland types. So I'm now gonna hand over to Modkin, who's gonna talk about our first work no, sorry, who am I handing out? I'm handing over to Seamus, sorry. <laughs> no worries, Ruth. I'm handing over to Seamus. Over to you. Yes, indeed. I am, in fact, Seamus. Uh, yes, indeed. So, uh, yeah, Seamus Bates, I'm an environmental anthropologist based at the Sir William Roberts Centre of Bangor University. And along with my colleague, Norman Dandy, uh, yeah, we are the uh, the token social scientists as part of this. Uh, no, we're, 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 we are going to be focusing on work package one, uh, as Ruth has said, understanding the ambitions, uh, understandings of our ambitions for woodland diversity. But just zooming out a, a little bit more from there, you know, our our focus here is is around woodland manager, as it says, understandings and ambitions for woodland diversity. What does it actually mean? Well, understanding what diversity means in a woodland context is not a fixed point. We've heard Ruth there giving a, an excellent natural scientist understanding of what woodland diversity means. But the reality of working definitions that managers use on the ground is <laughs> as diverse uh -huh, as the as the word itself and as the sort of deployment of, of that word itself. What woodland managers understand to be di diversifying a woodland, diversifying a landscape, diversifying an individual stand within a woodland changes from manager to manager, from context to context. And so we want to break that open and dig into how woodland managers are actually using that term on the ground, what it means for them, and where they're getting that information from. You know, where are they drawing these definitions and understandings from? Uh, and does that change in terms of different scales? And that issue of scale, of course, links into that second word there, resilience. Equally, how are woodland managers understanding resilience? How are they um, engaging with that as a concept? And what are they doing in order to build resilience within their woodland? Are they using diversification as a means to build resilience? Are they diversifying for other reasons? And are they using other practices to build resilience, uh, excluding diversification? These are all questions that we want to engage with with a, a sort of wide, as wide a variety of woodland managers as we can draw upon really to try and explore that. Um, spoiler alert, the way woodland managers generally understand uh, diversification is not, and diversity is not the way that Ruth has just uh, eloquently explained there as a natural scientist, it's often quite different. And that's interesting for us to explore and interesting for us to engage with. And part of this comes, as we see on the screen there, from this overriding preconception that you find in a lot of discourse, a lot of literature, a lot of policy uh, around... The gate was left open. Sorry. Uh, could I ask folk to uh, mute, mute, mute themselves? It's a little difficult to, uh, to concentrate. What was I saying? So uh, it comes from preconceptions around uh, woodland managers and woodland management in general. We often find uh, within discourse, we have a, a real sort of binary uh, between uh, so-called conservation woodlands and so-called production woodlands. And in a lot of policy and a lot of discourse, these are seen as monolithic 
constructs that 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 sit in wild opposition to each other. Uh, and even within that, we see some certain concepts which are often assigned exclusively to one or the other. We would we we see discussions of so-called conservation woodlands, uh, which are focused on uh, protected species lists and ideas of nativeness uh, become central and, and all-consuming, uh, which are often contrasted with production woodlands, which are expected to be single species monocultures, which purely focus on economics and logistics. Now, our starting point here is that while there are trends within particular woodlands, while there are core focuses of particular woodlands which might lean more towards con conservation and more towards production, these are not monolithic constructs. They are complex and varied and different spaces depending on 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 who on 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 the place itself. And even within that, even in a woodland which is predominantly focused on production, or even in a woodland which is predominantly focused on conservation, um, that does not exclude them. From, de from engaging with the entire, uh, the full variety of, uh, of concepts in terms of conservation production, um, on terms of species nativeness and diversi diversification itself. Um, and, that, and so that is our kind of start, so our, our, that is our entry point into this data. Um, and we, we're doing that uh, around three tasks, as, as we see below within this research structure. What are the current, as it stands today, understandings of uh, diversity and resilience and their connection in uh, UK forestry today, right now. Um, jumping over that that's second point there to task three, where do woodland managers want to go? What is their uh, objective? Where do they want to take their woodlands? Are they looking to diversify their the woodlands that, that they manage? And how are they going about doing that? Why and, and why not? And then the second task there in the center there, how is that happening? What are the strategies that woodland managers are deploying or not deploying, as the case may be, uh, in order to diversify their woodland in terms to build resilience within their woodlands? And 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 what are they doing to go about doing that? Uh, Ruth, if I, if I could have the next slide. Thanks very much. So how, uh, in terms of the sort of uh, brass tacks of what we're actually going to be doing with our time uh, over this period, uh, you can see here we've, we've broken this down into sort of three uh, three main bullet, uh, points. Um, first of all, we, we've obviously, of course, got our ethics process, very important within any social science research. That's actually now completed. That was all completed uh, last year. And so we are now rolling into uh, objectives 1.1 and 1.2 within our sort of work package. Uh, first of all, understandings of woodland diversity. This is uh, a sort of lit literature review of academic and policy documents around current uh, sort of discourse around woodland diversity. But then expanding that, contrasting that, building upon that with these uh, 20 semi-structured interviews uh, with woodland managers and then our subsequent analysis of this. And this is uh, very much the meat and potatoes uh, of our sort of research process is engaging with actual woodland managers, often hopefully in situ in their woodlands, which, which they manage and doing these sort of long form interviews uh, so that they can uh, discuss with us their understandings of uh, diversity and diversification and where they're getting that, that sort of knowledge from. And then the second part, part, part of this objective 1.2, then uh, we're going to be running uh, some focus groups uh, exploring what diversity could and should be intrinsic to Britain's future woodlands. And of course, focus groups are, are, are a very uh, useful qualitative uh, research tool where we allow uh, different groups of stakeholders. And you see, we, we've listed our, 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 uh, our, 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 our plans for these these different stakeholder groups, policymakers, woodland managers, community members, and, and scientists, uh, allows discussion within this group um, of these questions around diversity and around the future of, uh, of of British woodlands, which again will be subsequently analysed. And from this this data, from this uh, from this analysis, we will then look to uh, generate publications and and other outputs, which can be put into the hands of woodland managers. Uh, policymakers and all, mem all, all members of the Woodland community, as well as, of course, um, academics. So that is our plan. That's what we're hoping to do. Uh, Ruth, I'll pass back to you. Thank you very much, Seamus. I think we've got another poll coming up just to make sure you're also awake, which will lead in nicely to our second work package. So this is asking whether you would consider changing the leaf microbial diversity 
So whether e.g. through increasing tree diversity or spraying with a microbial mix to increase the resilience against tree diseases. So once you've voted, if you submit that, and then we can see whether this is something, a technique that people have even thought about or not. It's quite a new technique, so many of you might not have even thought about it or heard about it before. Hopefully Annie can see when most people have voted. Yep, that's majority now. So that's the results coming up. There we go. So yep, 36% of you would consider it, 10% of you wouldn't, and just over half of you don't know. So hopefully maybe at the end of this project, we might have a few more answers to those of us that voted don't know. But in the meantime, I'll hand over to Modkin. Thank you, Ruth. Um, yes, so I'm Mojgan Rabi, a um, microbiologist from the uh, University of Birmingham, uh, along with my colleague um, Rob Jackson, uh, we work on work package two, um, ecosystem functionality and to understand the microbiome and tree resilience. So a uh, more diverse woodland provide a greater range of microbes on the leaves uh, of trees. Uh, and if we get greater range of microbial diversity that would help uh, with plants to resist pathogen infection. So the overall aim of um, this work package is to understand whether mixed plantation and mixed species and diversification result in more diverse uh, microbiome uh, that protect our plants from uh, foliar pathogens. So the hypothesis that uh, um, we are uh, testing uh, here or if a monoculture woodland compared to a mixed species woodland has lower microbial diversity per tree leaf, and if a mixed species woodland has a highly diverse leaf microbiome that uh, would uh, compete the pathogen. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so there are some definition here before I move to explain about each objective. Um, so there are different ways we can measure diversity. Uh, we have alpha diversity, that is a species diversity within a particular plot or area, as you can see that on the image. We have a beta diversity, that is a species diversity between any two plots or areas and the communities. And uh, we have gamma diversity that um, of the entire forest, that is a species diversity in all plots and areas, as again, uh, if you look at the image. And next slide, please. And so in work package 2.1, uh, we want to understand if whether microbial diversity on a leaf increase with tree diversity. So to understand this, we will do a diversity analysis of three microbial co uh, communities. We will sample from uh, five trees um, uh, per plot and uh, from each uh, tree, we take uh, 10 leaves. And uh, these are from uh, forest research plots and within uh, do DNA extraction to identify bacterial population using uh, 16S ribosomal RNA and for fungi is the ITS regions. Uh, and then we will assess the uh, alpha, beta, and gamma diversity of the leaf microbiome to understand if there's any significant differences in microbial diversity in monoculture versus mixed species diversity. Uh, we will also identify a difference in uh, pathogen abundance between trees and plants. Uh, so this would tell us if microbial diversity of leaf increases with mixed species plantation. Uh, next slide, please. So in work package 2.2, we want to understand the role of microbial diversity uh, in uh, pathogen establishment and suppression. So we will focus on uh, the stroma and scot pine. Uh, so scot pine is at risk from that is from a needle blight, uh, an economically important uh, disease, particularly affecting pine tree in the UK, and it's predicted to increase over the next uh, 20 years because of climate change and because of the um, uh, temperature is warming up. Therefore, diversification may increase uh, in the resilience of uh, woodlands in which they dominate. So as you can see, uh, there are the symptoms uh, on the, of the stroma needle blight, uh, on a stop point, so you can see that uh, the reddish spots or browning spots of um, on necrotic needles. So uh, we will assess the core leaf microbiome for microbial biocontrol strategies. And uh, first, from the samples that we collected, we will quantify the abundance of the pathogen cells uh, from each plot. 
then we will also collect the culturable microbes from leaves uh, and we will investigate the pot potential disease suppression by individual or combination of the culturable microbes that we collected. So we will examine whether the stroma disease is suppressed on the scalp pine using the best culturable antagonistic microbes that we collect uh, in combination with the pathogen and on, on their own. And next slide, please. And so this is like an overview of the workflow of the project. So as again, so we call examples from uh, mixed plantation and monocultures. Uh, when we uh, choose five trees uh, per species per plot, we take leaves. Uh, and then we do the unculturable ones by doing DNA extraction of the microbes uh, and doing uh, sequencing to understand the bacterial and fungal community composition. And also we do uh, we culture the uh, the uh, antagonistic uh, microbes and then we can use them against the uh, pathogen by infecting the trees and understanding uh, if the cultural microbes are able to uh, stop uh, or uh, suppress the disease uh, progression. So the outcome would be that uh, the, uh, the, the guide us the, on the development of management strategies for diversification in both package four. Uh, we will do peer review publication and the data will be publicly available uh, for future studies on microbial biodiversity. Uh, thank you, and I hand over to the Ruth. Thank you very much. So we're now moving on to our sort of third challenge or our third work package. And this is one that um, I'm leading, but it's in conjunction with a whole range of other species experts. Um, so you can see their names along the bottom of the slide there. So we're looking at birds, lichens, mammals, fungi, invertebrates, and bryophytes, the mosses. And the aim of this work package is to really try and um, understand how different mixtures of tree species will provide resilience to the biodiversity that we find within our woodlands. So we're looking to see whether if you diversify more monoculture plantations, you can improve the biodiversity benefits. And if you diversify our semi-natural woodlands, whether you can help improve the resilience to threats. So some of you may have um, heard of our work that we've previously done, where we found out how many species are hosted by ash trees or how many species are hosted by oak trees. And that work's been really useful um, for a variety of uh, people. And we're gonna do the same thing for Scots Pine and Sitka. So using existing databases, we're going to collate together a list of all the species that we know will be found on Scots pine and Sitka spruce trees. And then we're going to find out whether those species will use a variety of other tree species that you might use to diversify either Scots pine or Sitka spruce woodlands with. We're going to actually see how different tree or sort of test if whether different tree, tree species are able to substitute for each other in terms of the biodiversity they support. And we're going to test this using lichens. We're using lichens because we've only got one year of field work. It's only a two year project and we've only got one field season. So we need to use species that don't move about very much, that don't change in terms of seasonality or between years in their abundance. And we're going to use um, some plots that Modkin referred to, their forest research plots, where they've got replicated experiments of um, different species mixtures. So they'll have different differences in abundance of Scots pine and Sitka planted in different ratios. And we're going to see how that influences lichen composition on the plots. But we're not just interested in the biodiversity of our woodlands, we're also interested in their functioning. And by that we mean things like decomposition, changes in nutrient properties, changes in the soil properties. And again, this is an example here from some of our ash work. Um, I talked to CIM about this a couple of years ago probably, so some of you might remember this. But for the ash work, we look to see what tree species might replace ash. Firstly, in terms of how good they were at supporting ash-associated biodiversity. And you can see oak was good, and things like poplar and wild cherry were less good. But if you look at it in terms of the functioning, in terms of the impacts those tree species have on, for example, the soil, you can see though oak was good for biodiversity, it was less good in terms of replicating the functioning. 
and we're hoping to do a similar analysis for Scots pine and Sitka spruce to say what other tree species are similar to them and which tree species are different. And before actually we move on to work package four, we're going to have another poll. So this is very much thinking about methods you might use to increase diversity in a woodland. And you can tick as many as you want. So you've got continuous forestry cover, natural regeneration, novel planting regimes, including non-native species or non-local species. So by non-local, I mean things like a species might be considered native to the UK, but it's not native to a particular devolved country or region or other methods. So you can pick your choice or as many choices as you want and then submit them. And we will see which methods are most um, popular amongst the audience here. There we go. Natural regeneration, winning hands down at 90% there. Um, followed by novel planting regimes at 58%, and then fairly close um, call between continuous forestry cover at 33% and other methods at 29%. And you'll probably realise why we put that poll in as I hand over to Chris, who's going to talk about our final work package. So over to you, Chris. Thanks, Ruth. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Chris Nichols. I'm Conservation Evidence Manager at the Woodland Trust, and it's fantastic um, to be, uh, I suppose, the, the kind of practitioner organisation that um, that uh, is, is um, involved in the Diversity Project. Uh, you, you may already know quite a lot about the Woodland Trust and how um, we own lots of um, sites and do a lot of woodland creation, woodland restoration, and and campaigning and and uh, policy influence around the protection of of woods and trees. Uh, but we also have a research program and uh, we fund research, we collaborate on research and um, Diversity Project is is an example of that where we um, are really getting involved um, in the, uh, the nitty gritty of, of a research project, which is fantastic because um, bridging that um, that so-called kind of academic practitioner divide is um, is one of the one of the aims of the project, um, as well as um, Ruth mentioned earlier. Um, uh, uh, sort of um, breaking down barriers or perceived barriers between um, uh, practitioners working towards conservation objectives and um, maybe more commercial objectives and uh, the overlaps there and um, and all the other um, objectives that you might be managing wooden sites for as well. Um, it's, it's often not just one or the other. Um, so this work package that, um, that I'm leading is um, around solutions and knowledge exchange. So um, so the idea is to sort of encourage um, the, the results of, of the other work packages to be used in a, in a practical setting. So the idea is that, you know, we can make evidence based management decisions. So um, so we're kind of facilitating communication um, kind of within the project team, but also externally as well um, through things, um, you know, like your, your, your normal things that you would expect, like a YouTube channel where you can um, see um, uh, updates about the project and Twitter and you can find us at diversity underscore UK on Twitter and um, webinars like this we'll be doing and, um, and and blogs coming out so all of that normal kind of comm stuff but also um, uh, trying to um, do some more innovative comms which we'll uh, mention in a, in a second um, but the idea is that uh, we'll be working with land managers and, and policy makers and a whole range of other stakeholders so that it's it's kind of a two-way co-development as the project comes, uh, as the project progresses, for how we um, uh, communicate the outputs and um, engage with practitioners around the outputs of this project, rather than just make it that one way um, uh, kind of flow of, of information. So uh, next slide, please, Ruth. So one of the ways that uh, we're kind of um, uh, kind of getting that two way um, co co development co production of um, of, of the project as we go is, is establishing a practitioner panel that Ruth mentioned at the beginning. Um, and the idea behind this is that um, we'll be able to kind of um, get have a, a group of, of woodland managers, people who are actually working and making these kind of decisions about tree diversity um, on the ground um, to, uh, to get together out on site and, and really thrash out um, how the project's going and uh, scrutinize the project and, 
and critically appraise the results um, as they're coming in kind of in, in real time as, as the project progresses, um, assessing the kind of feasibility of what we're doing in, in, a, in a practical sense and, and, uh, and checking that it's going to actually be, be useful for implementation um, down the line and also um, contributing to um, assessing the, the transferability of, of the results to other woodland types as well, because obviously we mentioned it's predominantly um, focusing on conifer species, but it, uh, you know, tree species diversity principles are not um, restricted to conifer species. Um, and, and really kind of promote that frank discussion and explore co uh, kind of common understandings uh, or maybe different understandings of different terms and, and, and language and how we're, how we're kind of um, approaching and pitching a lot of these kind of um, uh, concepts and, and results as they come out. Um, so yeah, the idea that we'll be doing kind of field-based learning for the project team and for the practitioners and then um, making it as transferable as possible to the wider kind of sector, forestry and conservation sector. Uh, and we've got we're going to have a um, some nice qualitative kind of art based outputs of getting a uh, an illustrator to join us to some of these meetings to sort of uh, you know illustrate and sort of um, you know allow us to convey some of the more kind of uh, nuanced um, discussions uh, visually. Um, so um, so yeah, great. I think we'll move on to the next slide. So another um, kind of output from. Um, well, it's uh, this work package, but it's kind of more an overarching work package for the project is um, it is development of those management strategies that you just voted on in that poll um, and, and assessing their kind of feasibility for um, species diversification. Um, so we'll be, uh, we, we mentioned previously, we were looking uh, at continuous cover forestry, um, sort of novel planting regimes, uh, including non-native and non-local species. Uh, natural regeneration, sort of, uh, you know, natural colonization, um, and emerging microbial diversification strategies. And, and you know, we're not saying they're the only uh, management strategies for diversification, but they're just the ones we're focusing on uh, for this project, which is a nice kind of um, uh, range of kind of novel and um, more well-established techniques. Um, and uh, so this is kind of very much in collaboration with um, the, the kind of social science work package as well, where we'll be um, linking in with the, uh, the interviews and the um, uh, and the practitioner panel uh, meetings uh, to to sort of deliver the outputs in practitioner facing publications, but also a, a podcast um, run as well um, to sort of make that um, hopefully as accessible as possible. Different kind of routes of communication um, to uh, to see just how how useful or feasible are those management strategies are for, for the aims here and, and what they what else they are being used for as well. So should we move on to the next slide, please? Um, so to, to go along with that, we'll also be producing a series of um, case studies and to sort of um, enhance our uh, ability to communicate those case studies, uh, we'll, we'll um, be uh, commissioning some short, um, short uh, videos um, to uh, to sort of communicate each of those case studies so they're not just a sort of document that sits on a shelf actually there's a bit more kind of um visual engagement and uh, uh will be um uh, you know they'll be sort of able to be kind of viewed at leisure uh, throughout the pro uh, throughout the kind of after the lifetime of the project um and those case studies will um uh, be split into those looking at kind of woodland creation sites um and those looking at more mature woodland um for for different objectives and with different species that we've kind of already mentioned the, the scots pine and the sitka spruce species that we're focusing on and uh, the, the the maybe more conservation uh, focused objectives and the more commercial focused objectives so to sort of get that, that that full mix of kind of um of priorities for for the case studies to see just uh what you know how these methodologies for increasing species diversity at the site are working in on the ground um in, in the real world um, and that's similar to some of uh, the outputs that um, was produced for Ruth's previous work on ash and oak um, uh, functional redundancy as well. So, um, so they're still available as well if you want to look back at those as um, kind of a really useful resource that that can uh, that could be used in the future. Thank you, Chris. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank all my project um, team for contributing today. And as you can see on the slide there, if you want to find out more, we've got a Twitter account, we've got a Mastodon account, we've got a website, and there's my email address. So, you know, if you want to follow up on any of this, do feel free to, to get in contact with any of those needs. And I'll stop sharing now so that we can then move over and have some discussion and questions.
Thank you very much, Ruth and Seamus and Chris and Marjan. Really fascinating to hear about all the aims and ambitions of the project. And um, I think there's certainly, you know, talking about the case studies there, it'll be a great opportunity for many SAI members to get involved in that as well. So um, I'm sure this won't be the last time we'll be hearing from you and it'd be great to have a, a similar event further down in the project as well. So just in terms of some of the questions, um, the first few are actually more discussion, but I'll read them out anyway. So Charles Langtree, um, based in Nottingham, pointed out the, the first poll question asked about native woodlands and the answer no related to planted native woodlands. Um, if we related this to semi-natural woodlands on ancient woodland sites, which are much more resilient, would probably get a different view from people. And then Jeanette, who's based up in, in Venetia, um, as pointed out, a lot of our ancient woodlands in Scotland are extremely lacking in tree diversity um, due to decades of overgrazing, preventing regeneration, and that many have little but birch. Um, so a diversity of species is available, but not present. And then a comment from Northamptonshire that the majority of ancient semi-natural woodlands have simplified to become ash dominated, sometimes 80% plus of the canopy and are currently be massively impacted by ash dieback. Um, would any of the speakers like to comment on any of those points that have been raised there, please? I suppose, yeah. Oh, sorry, Ruth, I see you come off um, mute as well. But just to sort of mention briefly that, yeah, I think there's um, there's something to be said around the different ways maybe those woodlands have come into being, whether they've been planted re uh, relatively recently or whether they're ancient woodland sites. But yeah, uh, um, not all ancient woodland sites are um as resilient as we might want them to be and that um you know we uh, are very interested in improving the, the condition of of sites for biodiversity and other objectives but um one of those one of the criteria for assessing the condition of a woodland site is of course um number of tree species present so um i think definitely one way of increasing the condition of those existing ancient woodland sites and planted woodland sites is by um looking at the mix of species and the and the structural diversity of course and the pests and diseases and all the other kind of um condition criteria that might be there but i think it's a really important um point to, to not just take for granted the resilience of our of our different types of woodland thank you chris did you have anything to add to that Ruth? I was just going to add that I think sometimes we forget to set our woodlands in a historical context and we assume that the diversity that is there now is the full diversity that could be there and perhaps certainly thinking about perhaps our um, oak woodlands on the west coast they've been heavily managed historically to have perhaps a far higher abundance of oak than any other tree species um, for historical management reasons and we don't stop to think about the diversity of tree species that could be there um, if it weren't for that historical management. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. So um, regarding the microbial um, diversity, um, Jeanette said it's hugely important and good to see, but um, don't know enough to make a decision and has posted a link in the chat if anyone want to look at it. A question from Lindsay McKinley asking, is anyone specifically looking at vascular higher plants? And if not, why is this group not included? We're not specifically looking at it in as much as we are focusing on species that directly use the tree in some way. Um, so we're not specifically looking at the ground flora. We have done when we've done similar work for the ash trees, um, but it's actually the ground floor of a woodland is as much influenced by the light that's coming through from the canopy, which is quite influenced by the sort of composition and the spacing of the trees as well as the individual tree species. So there's, there is some link obviously between the ground flora and the tree species that's present, but it's not as tight an association as for example, between a tree species and the lichens or the bryophytes that you might find on that tree. Um, so we have sort of limited the scope of the project, but I admit, you know, we're not saying that vascular plants are not important, they are. And, if you diversify woodland, what tree species you diversify work with will impact the ground flora. Thank you, Ruth. And there's some comments related to that and uh, a few links that have been shared in the chat on the ash work that you have um, that's been conducted and the oak work as well. Um, a question from a, a student. Um, so 
no question is ever a silly question, putting it in that response to you. So she's asking, regarding training to become a forestry manager after a career in psychiatry and psychology, so really appreciate Seamus's segment. Can you give an example in the disparity you mentioned between operationalized definitions of diversity? So that's for Seamus, please. My goodness, that's a very specific question. Sorry. Uh, 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 an example of sorry say, say the question again I'm yeah really too, I'm really too stupid to answer it the, um, can you give an example in the disparity you mentioned between the operationalized definitions of diversity an example of its use or an example of it I, I, I think i'm worried your, that i'm the only person in the room that doesn't, doesn't understand the question i feel like a true idiot it's a wonderful i feeling. think in your talk seamus you mentioned about what ecologists look at as a traditional view of diversity compared to a, a forest manager oh, i see what you mean right no okay fair enough fair enough so what what, what we mean by that by that kind of thing is that it's kind of what ruth mentioned in, in terms of our overriding objectives in terms of scale Right. So Ruth there was talking about a, how a natural scientist would define diversity, a very formulaic, sort of very um, something that could be quantified in a, in, in a laboratory hypothesis and, and proven. But many people do not understand diversity in that way. They understand it in a much more intuitive gut reaction kind of way. Right. It's much more about the feel of the woodland. It's difficult to it's difficult to. Um, quantify these kind of things you know we, we, it's similar to how you ask uh, if you were to ask Ruth to talk about what is a healthy tree and you were to ask uh, 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 a small woodland owner what is a healthy tree they would answer you in very different ways Ruth would talk about biological complexity and you know microbial diversity and blah 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 whereas someone else might talk about a verdant tree or it's a it's it's strong looking you see what I'm what I'm getting at. So when we're talking about the difference between a kind of a natural science definition of diversity versus a policy definition of diversity, which I think Chris is probably going to come in and talk about, uh, versus a, an intuitive understanding of diversity, this is kind of what we're getting at. Um, Chris, do you understand the question better than I? You're going to give a much uh, no, better I suppose... answer. I can I can feel you coming in from from off screen. Um, um, yeah, no, I, I'm not a better answer, but I suppose it's just to take that kind of one step further is when we talk about operationalizing different. Um, uh, def definitions and diversity maybe we're thinking about what uh, what the impact they'll have on the ground and uh, often that's linked to concepts around resilience and um, that's another quite um, useful but also murky word are we talking about ecological resilience of sites or are we talking about economic resilience and there's obviously going to be overlap between those two concepts but there's going to be massively impacted by the tree species choice and um, the, uh, the the kind of uh, management decisions as well it's not just about putting the trees in the ground and leaving them obviously as we know there's different uh, many different approaches to um, ongoing management and approach to how you create those uh, woodlands in the first place how you put the trees in the ground so um, there's a lot of operationalizing that can be done and that's a whole um, uh, kind of other topic to go on down and, and um, uh, and is, is a kind of yeah speak and you'll speak to lots of different practitioners will have lots of different kind of opinions on that um but no it's a really interesting question and also on on those trees trees in the ground on the issue of scale you know you might look at a monoculture in a, in a commercial plantation and think well this woodland is, is not, not at all diverse so the woodland manager might not have any interest in diversity and might not be considering this but you might engage with that woodland manager and say, well, no, no, this this plantation is not isn't diverse. But actually, when you look at the estate as a whole, if you zoom out a little bit and you look at the landscape and you look at the actual total region of which I manage, that is actually in total very diverse and has a, a real variety of different flora and fauna. And this small monoculture or this partial monoculture in this part of it actually contributes to a much larger ecosystem which you need to kind of zoom out a, a little bit to 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 look at and so when so and, and that's why Ruth was, was mentioning scales and understandings of scale and so on so there are lots of different facets of that and lots of different as as Chris says murky concepts which which which, which are part of that and how, how they're being deployed and they will be deployed differently depending on on who's doing them 
Thank you very much, Seamus. Um, listen to Chris, don't listen to me. He's, he's, he's smarter than I am. Um. <laughs> Would any of the other speakers like to respond to any of the questions that have been raised? I think that's it on terms of the questions that have been posted. Um, there are some links in the chat to um, various papers and publications. Um, so do have a look at those. If you're after any of the publications, um, you can contact um, myself and I will help facilitate sharing those. Um, I'll just check the chat. No, just a, a thank you.